This is Ag Matters PM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network, brought to you by the Iowa Soybean Association. Your daily recap of the information that affects Iowa's farmers, producers, and consumers, right here in the heart of the heartland. With reports from our award-winning broadcast team of Dustin Hoffman, Riley Smith, and Mark Magnuson. Now, from the IARN studios in Des Moines, here's Riley Smith. Well, good day and welcome to Ag Matters PM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. I'm Riley Smith. Today is Thursday, April 27th, 2023. We're so glad you could join us for today's show. In today's episode, I talk with Iowa State climatologist Dr. Justin Glisson for our weekly chat on Iowa's climate patterns. We also have a check of that Ag Weather Outlook, but first, let's run down the markets. It's time now for the Ag Matters PM Closing Market Summary, your source for market analysis and settlement prices from the day's trade in Chicago, courtesy of the folks at agmarket.net. At the end of another trading day in the Ag Marketplace, we're talking with Robin Schmall of agmarket.net for a bit of analysis from today. Uh, Robin, what did we see first off going on in the grains today? <laughs> well, they got hit pretty hard today, at least the corn, probably the hardest hit of all of them, and then followed by the wheat and then soybean. Soybean meal is actually the only part of the complex that closed higher. Um, boy, there was just, uh, it was kind of like a Katie by the door selling. You know, July got hit the hardest as far as corn was concerned. So it narrowed up that spread between July and new crop. Uh, we, are, we are going into deliveries tomorrow, uh, first notice day for the May contracts. I don't know if that had a lot of influence on it or not, but basically when we looked at the uh, export uh, sales this morning, corn was at 400,000 metric ton. It was up 28% from last week, but down 49% from the four week averages on that level of sales. Now I have to put that into perspective as well. We also did see on the overnight a cancellation of 233,000 metric tons of corn to China. So any kind of real uh, positive news out of the export sales on corn compared to last week was quickly eliminated or was eliminated prior to that being released by the cancellation of corn by China. They've been switching some of that stuff over to Argentina, South America because of the cheaper prices. Now, soybeans. We're at export sales, we're at 311,000, uh, 300 metric tons. That was slightly better than last week, uh, up 38% from the four-week average. So that that was a better uh, news, uh, news to the market. Meal was at 158,400 metric ton, up 6% from the previous week, but down 40% from the four-week average. And then we had wheat at 155. 1,700 metric tons, down 40% from last week and down 7% from the four-week average. So wheat wheat was struggling from the lower export sales compared to last week, as well as the forecast for better coverage of rain in some of the real drier areas over the next couple of days. Whether that materializes or not, it doesn't make any difference because right now that's a new story that's into the market and that provided support or not support, but pressure on wheat. But wheat and corn follow each other fairly closely. So the pressure spilling over from corn, uh, you know, kept the pressure on wheat as well. So it wasn't a good day for the grain market. Uh, Canada estimates an increase of 6.2% in their wheat crop that they're going to, that they're planting. So we're looking for 27 million acres there up 6.2% from last year. Now, on the other side, moving over into South America as well, Cargill Cargill plans to boost their soy crush and biofuel production in Brazil. So they're going to put more uh, investment into the crushing facilities and biodiesel biodiesel fuel production in Brazil. So um, that's that in the bigger picture is going to have an impact because we have been seeing over the last quite a few years, we have been seeing Brazil's exports continue to increase on the world market share as the U.S. world market share has been slowly trending lower. Uh, So it's something that's in the bigger picture looking forward down the road. All right. And what are we seeing on the other side of the markets in the livestock complex? 
Well, livestock were on a little bit of a roller coaster, you know, early on today, uh, seeing lower prices then coming back higher and then going back a little bit. So kind of back and forth movement. Uh, export sales in beef were bad. Uh, they were at 9,500 metric ton. That was 50% lower than last week and 28% lower than the four week average. So that did not help that complex, but we haven't really seen any cash trading taking place yet. Some light sales yesterday took place um, in the south at 171 to 175, the north at 281 to 285. That's the live, south is the lives, north is the dressed. Now, very few, a couple hundred traded there, didn't give a good indication of what we could be looking at for cash this week. Now, the asking prices in the south are 176. The north, they're looking at 286 plus. Uh, is it going to be interesting to see what the Packers need to do? Now, we are seeing the strength in the underlying uh, box beef prices. We did see some variation earlier this week, but today... Box beef is up at the noon report, $1.49 in choice, up two seventeen dollars in select. Box beef was higher yesterday in both categories. So the demand still is there. It'll be interesting to see how aggressive those packers need to be. Now, their packer margins improved a little bit lately, but still they want to keep things in check. And, and the, the steady to slightly lower cash trade last week was a little bit of a surprise to the market. And I wonder if we, if they're just really trying to be cautious here and to what will actually unfold. I think we'll see some probably later today. Now, in the pork side, we had export sales of 54,000 metric ton. That was an actual marketing year high. So that provided some support in that market and more of that into deferred contracts because closer contracts closed a little bit lower today, but deferred contracts higher. But you know, the, the strength we've seen in the pork market over the last week has been a surprise. Uh, we've seen some significant in, in like the June contract over $5 increase in futures. So maybe we've established a bottom in there. Now, the interesting part of that is, is today on the daily direct morning report, we saw cash up $2.43. That would be incredible because yesterday cash was up uh, $2.51. Uh, and previous day, we had slightly higher cash. If this happens to be higher today, we may very well be setting in a bottom in that market because we haven't seen cash this strong for two days in a row or even on a single day for quite some time. Now, cutouts at noon are up $0.42. Cents. If we can hold that, uh, the we, we may start trending this market higher Maybe we're seeing a little bit lower numbers starting to come through than what we've been looking at before. And Packers are sensing that and needing to step up and, and aggressively go after those hogs. All right. Well, lots of great information today, Robin. For those of our listeners and our viewers who would like to get in touch with the folks at agmarket.net and learn more, how can they do that? Well, they can call me directly at 877-256-256. 3253, or if they go to agmarket.net, the main number is on there. They can call in and they'll be able to get uh, get a hold of anybody that's available. Great talking with you as always, Robin, and we look forward to chatting with you again soon. All right. Thank you. It's always a pleasure being on with you. That again was Robin Schmall of agmarket.net. We'll go ahead and take a look at how those numbers close. That's courtesy of the folks at Bar Chart. May corn is down 14 and a half at 627 even. December new crop down 12 and 3 quarters at 530 and 3 quarters. May soybeans down 9 and a quarter at 1426 and 3 quarters. November new crop down 11 and a quarter at 1255 and a half. May soybean meal up 190 at 427.90. Soybean oil down 130 at 50.78. Chicago wheat down 12 and a half at 614 and 3 quarters. Minneapolis spring wheat down 39 even at 769 even. Kansas City hard red wheat down 14 and 3 quarters at 778 and 3 quarters. May oats down 16 and a quarter at 306 and a quarter. On the Merck, June live cattle up 62 at 165.20. May feeders up 125 at 211.52. May lean hogs down 15 at 78.12. May pork cutout down 37 at 84 even. 
June Class 3 milk up 27 cents at 17.45. And that's been a check of the markets here on Ag Matters PM. We're going to go ahead and take a quick break to hear from our sponsor, the Iowa Soybean Association and the Soy Checkoff. When we come back, I talk with Iowa State climatologist Dr. Justin Glisson. This is Ag Matters PM. Iowa Soybean Association is driven to deliver for Iowa's 40,000 soybean farmers. We're proud to provide objective agronomic research, a helping hand with soil and water stewardship, and timely industry news powered by the Soybean Checkoff. Learn more at IASoybeans.com. Welcome back to Ag Matters PM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. I'm Riley Smith. Well, again, I had my weekly chat with Iowa State climatologist Dr. Justin Glisson, and we had some pretty interesting things to talk about this week. Uh, of course, we've seen some cooler temperatures a bit of frost as well. And you know, even to make it feel more like winter, we even saw a little bit of aurora borealis this far south, which was uh, certainly a great thing to see. Uh, just super cool to see that in the skies if you were able to. Otherwise, we're looking at some pretty interesting spring weather going forward. So Glisten said to look out for some cooler temperatures and maybe drier conditions as well. Well, we are back again this week with Iowa State climatologist Dr. Justin Glisson to talk a bit about the climatological patterns here in Iowa. Now, first off, Justin, uh, we talk about the drought monitor a lot. Tell us a little bit about this kind of dryness that we've seen recently and how that could continue, you know, despite some rainfall events that we've been seeing. Uh, yeah, hi, Riley. So, yes, we've, we've had widespread rainfall across the state over the last 14 to 20 days. Uh, several outbreaks of severe weather. So with thunderstorms, we see more rainfall. We've seen good rainfalls across uh, western Iowa, all forms of precipitation, in fact, snow, sleet, grapple, uh, rain. Uh, but as we start to move into the growing season, we're starting to ramp up the climatological expectation per week of the amount of rainfall that we should see. Uh, so even with these wider spread rainfalls, we do see pockets of shorter term dryness going back 30 to 60 days across southern Iowa and then portions of northwestern and eastern Iowa as well. So these are the, the parts of the state that we monitor that we look closely at on a week to week basis as we give recommendations to the U.S. drought monitor. So we may see an expansion of that D0 abnormally dry category across portions of the state as a reflection of those shorter term dryness that we see uh, across the state. Now, last night we saw some pretty good frost conditions, which could have been a bit detrimental to people who might have planted already. But with that dryness that we just mentioned, could that have helped to protect against frost damage a little bit? So with the widespread rainfalls that we've seen across the state, wetter soils won't uh, drop temperatures as fast as drier soils. We think of wintertime, drier soil profiles will freeze deeper and faster. So there is a thermodynamic uh, blanket there with wetter soils and the warmer temperatures that we have that can help mitigate uh, any impacts of frost and freeze. You know, two weeks ago, temperatures in the 80s and 90s, planters were rolling, uh, pretty good planting activity out there. And then uh, over the recent term, colder temperatures and more rainfall slowed field work down. So we, yes, we have some uh, emergence, we could have some emergence issues given the colder soils and the, the colder rains. Uh, but overall, I don't think we're seeing widespread impacts right now. And then just kind of looking into the next couple weeks or so, obviously farmers are itching to get in the fields. You know, what's the likelihood that we could see them get in? Because with these colder temperatures, you know, it's not been quite warm enough, especially for corn to get in the ground. Well, luckily our Iowa farmers, when they see a window to roll, they roll. So uh, it's looking like that colder signal hangs around uh, for the next six to 10 days. Uh, a drier signal though, which would be good for not getting too wet to get out to get the planters out. Uh, but overall, yes, that, that colder signal hangs around. Uh, but I do think that we'll have several windows uh, for farmers to get out. So you think back to last April, the eighth coldest April, April on record, along with pretty good wetness. Uh, so this April so far has been um, uh, very much better than last year. And we got planted. Yeah, exactly. And then aside from, uh, you know, planting, I guess, this is just something that was also happening over the weekend. Uh, we saw some aurora borealis uh, in the skies pretty far south. I have some friends from northwest Missouri that were even uh, sending pictures of, of that. So what kind of caused the aurora borealis to be so visible this far south? 
Yeah, so we're talking about space weather now. Uh, coronal mass ejection from the, the sun, huge, larger than the size of the planet Earth, uh, amount of gas and radiation and electromagnetic radiation that's expended from the sun right at the Earth. Uh, it gets uh, hung up in the magnetic fields of Earth, and that's where you see the aurora borealis across the northern hemisphere. The strength of that uh, coronal mass ejection will give us the, the likelihood of seeing the uh, aurora further south. So we have a K index that we use to give us an idea of, uh, of if the aurora will be visible uh, given that strength of the cor coronal mass ejection. So a K index of basically six or seven or above will give us the likelihood of seeing the aurora this far south. 2004, when I was in college at Mizzou in Columbia, Missouri, right in the middle of Missouri, uh, there was a coronal mass ejection in which we saw aurora that I had never seen before. And I've done Arctic research, hence that up in the northern part of the uh, United States, up in Alaska. And I've never seen an aurora like I saw in Missouri. So the strength of that storm will dictate how far south we can see those. And of course, that produced uh, a lot of great photos, saw all that uh, all over Twitter, Facebook, uh, from the internet uh, over the weekend. Is there anything else uh, going on weather-wise in Iowa that our listeners should know about today? Well, we can think about lag of weather impacts, in, meaning that that snowpack across the upper Midwest and the upper M Mississippi Basin that had a rap rapid melt about two weeks ago with those very warm temperatures that temperatures that we saw. We're starting to see major flooding along most of the river gauges along the Miss Mississippi border of Iowa. So we look for that crest to occur over the weekend into next week, but we could see record levels of flooding along several points uh, on the eastern side of the state, uh, Quad Cities, uh, Dubuque possibly. Uh, so we'll just have to monitor the amount of rainfall that we get over the next seven to 10 days to see if we have any additional inputs into the stream and in river systems. Uh, but definitely flooding is uh, on the minds of our eastern islands. All right, and uh, for those of our listeners and our uh, viewers who would like to get in touch, and learn more and even provide with you uh, some reports on the ground conditions, how can they do that? Yes, my direct line is 515-281-8981. My email is justin.glisson at iowaagriculture.gov. And you can Google Iowa Climatology Bureau, find all that information and various climatological and weather reports along with current conditions and climatological outlooks, all that kind of information. All right, thanks for taking the time to visit with us today, as always, Justin, and we'll chat with you again next week. Thanks, Riley. Always nice to be with you. That again was Iowa State climatologist Dr. Justin Glisson. Speaking of the weather, let's go ahead and take a look at that ag weather outlook. Well, we just got done talking about cool temperatures, but honestly, going into the next week or so, we're looking at warmer, more spring-like temperatures going forward. Over the next couple days, we've got temps possibly into the 70s, a bit of rain mixed into there as well. So really no time like the spring. Uh, hopefully that water can help with the drought conditions a little bit and of course uh, help us as we get into planting season as well. So let's see what the National Weather Service has in store for the next 24 hours. As you can see from the National Weather Service, we have some nice temperatures for these next couple days. Today will be partly to mostly sunny and breezy with highs ranging from the upper 60s to low 70s. Tonight we have variably cloudy skies with a chance for showers in the northwest, lows overnight ranging from the mid to upper 40s. Tomorrow there's a chance for showers across this state, otherwise it will be mostly sunny, highs ranging from the mid 50s to about 70. And taking a look at the affiliate weather map for tomorrow, Cherokee will see showers and a high of 54, Shenandoah showers as well with a high of 62, Des Moines mostly sunny and then some p.m. showers with a high around 70. Waterloo, mostly sunny and showers with a high of 69. Albia, mostly sunny and showers with a high of 70. And then Clinton will see partly sunny skies with a high of 69. For more detailed forecasts in your part of the state, make sure to check in with your local Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network affiliate. That's been a check of the Ag Weather Outlook, and that also brings us to the end of this episode of Ag Matters PM. You can find all of our content on our website at iowaagnet.com. You can also follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and LinkedIn, and you can find all of our video content as well as previous episodes of AMPM on our YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell to see when those videos go live. 
Don't forget as well our free twice daily market podcast on Apple, Amazon, Google, Spotify, and Podbean. From the IARN studios in Des Moines, I'm Riley Smith. On behalf of Mark Magnuson and Dustin Huffman, we thank you for watching. This has been Ag Matters PM.